Okay, well, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Liam Hartree back with you today with another episode of Presenting Champions. And today I'm joined by legendary former professional boxer John Thaxton, who many people will know, won the British and European EBU, European at that titles also the wbf um world title as well was in there with some amazing names including ricky hatton um is now a coach and trainer passing on his knowledge and skills to the younger generation was fairly recently featured in this book you can see that sweet fighting man as well uh there's a bit of his life story in there for people who want to know more um so today we're going to be talking about everything boxing obviously but we'll also be going a little bit deeper into the mindset that it takes to reach such a high level in one of the toughest sports in the world professional boxing so john uh, champ thank you so much for taking time for this today mate i really really appreciate you making no, time thanks for having me thanks for having me. it's good good to go back over old times good memories absolutely absolutely now, just now, before we uh, started recording, I was asking you about your gym and everything, and you were saying about how well that's going, how much you enjoy that. Tell us a little bit about how your life is now post-boxing in 2024 and what you're doing to help the next generation in terms well, of training. When I, when I finished boxing, when I finished boxing, um, I had a couple of years out from it. Then I started training some amateur who then went pro. So I then got a pro license and went that way. And then COVID struck and stopped everything. But while I was doing this, in the background, um, I was working with people with disabilities. Um, and I've now set up a gym. So I've left the pro game. I've left, so I'm not a pro trainer anymore. But I now work in a gym that I've co founded called Able to Be. And uh, I work with people with disabilities, stroke survivors, people who've had heart conditions, been in hospital, people with cerebral palsy, um, you name it, I work with it. And we do online classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They're free of charge. So get a community based online. Um, but the success we've had, we've had people come in and say, John, you know, I've had a stroke. They said, I'm never, ever going to walk again. What do you think? Or I've had, I've got cerebral palsy. The doctors, physios, doctors, surgeons have all said, I'm never going to work. What do you think? You know, I'm not a miracle curer, but I show people what they can do, not what they can't. And I look at them and it's about changing people's mindset. And I've always done that. I've always had the ability to sort of like get people to believe in themselves because I believed in myself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, no one else is going to. Confidence is great. When people walk in and people say, yeah, I'm confident. But in the boxing ring, you get punched on the snout, confidence can be lost. I'm telling you. But if you believe in yourself, you'll turn around and go, and they feel one of these. But getting back to my gym, people have come into me saying they're never going to be able to walk. But we're strengthening their legs. We're changing their mindset. And if you look at some of our videos on our YouTube channel, Able to Be, it's in the background, in the background, Able to Be, um, Instagram me, I've got some great videos on there. And you'll see the work we do and the way we change lives. And it's remarkable. And I love it. Absolutely incredible. I mean, it shows so many things there, John, you know, including how much the body and mind are connected as well, which is a very, very important topic. Um, talk to us about that a little bit more from your point of view in terms of that's got to be one of the most rewarding jobs in the world. I mean, it's probably more rewarding than like the pro training and things like that. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, I tell you what, if you s look me at look in look at my videos, I'm telling you, when people say, you know, I'm having a bad day. I don't feel great. Oh, life is this, life is that. I tell you what, I say to people, I tell you what, you come and work with me. You'll see people who should be having bad days. You'll see parents with di kids with disabilities, kids with issues. They're the people who should be having a bad day, but they're the guys and the people who turn around, who embrace life, who thinks, you know what? We've got issues. We haven't been felt. We haven't been dealt a fair hand. But we're going to make the bloody most of it and we're going to come back fighting and the way people think and the way i get them to think you can do anything you know these two twins i trained i looked at him in my class one of my classes they had cerebral palsy 
and a bit of learning difficulties as well. And I said to him, I said, if you could do anything in the world, what would you like to be able to do? And they both went, we'd like to be able to walk. I said, I can't promise anything, but if you do my sessions, you might be able to do it. But I believe, now they used to love punch me in the face. They're only little, so it didn't hurt. And I didn't mind. So what I do is, I stood there with him, and I let him punch me in the face. And then I stepped back. Now to punch you in the face, I had to step forward. But I was watching them in my class and I knew they had strength in their legs. So I knew what they could do. But it's believing that they can do it. So there they were, boom, 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 hit my face. And I'm saying, hey, you're walking, boy, you're walking. And all of a sudden they go, oh, yeah, man. The mum's crying, they're crying. Well, look at me. And I'm just standing there going, that's what I do. I'm screaming inside, but I'm trying to be cool. But I'm screaming inside because how proud I am of what we've done. And I'm passing that knowledge on to, to the people I, I work with. Also, my daughters. I work with both my daughters. So I'm passing the knowledge on to them. And the success my elders has had with, with certain clients, I'm so proud of her. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the fact is a family uh, affair as well is awesome. But I'm just taking that in, to be honest, mate, because when I do the, this podcast, I have a lot of people on here who do that type of thing, whether they're in like Paralympics or they're in different mm. competitions. They've been paralyzed, they've been born with something. And it's such a powerful uh, thing when you hear the stories, like what you were saying there. I mean, I can be moved to like nearly to tears at times with some of the things people have been through. And, you, you know, you've got to keep a straight face. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so with that in mind, then anybody who's watching this, who's feeling a bit sort of, well, like you were saying, they're feeling down. They don't know if they've got a way out of their problems, whether it's mental problems, physical problems, whatever. The, the, the thing about this is a lot of these problems can be isolating. What would you say if there's anyone listening to this who needs that dose of inspiration and, you know, being picked up a little bit, if you get what I mean? Okay. okay. Again, I'm not no miracle work. We all have our problems, but it's how we deal with them. And, you know, take one day at a time, but look where you want to be in, in the next month, short term goal, where you want to be this time next month, short term goal, long term goal, or mid term goal of a year, you know, where do you want to be this time next year, then have a five year goal, where do you want to be in five years time and every day, try and do something to make a step closer and closer and closer to that, 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 that short term, mid term, long term goal. Every day, make a step, make something, do something that'll bring you closer. Or, and let's be fair, change. Some people got to change. And in life, change can be the hardest thing in the world to do because we're all set in our routines. We all get up, we might clean our teeth, we do this, we do that, we do that, we go off to work, we come home, we have our tea. Some of us might go to the pub, some of us might go to the gym. I don't know. But changing that routine can sometimes be so crazy that's the hardest thing to do, change. Absolutely, yeah, 100%. I'm with you on that. Now, another thing here, obviously we're talking about this with Able to Be, and you gave a shout out earlier with the Instagram and all the different things people can uh, follow what you're doing. But in terms of if people want to contribute more actively, you know, if they, I don't know if you need like sponsors or you need people to help out at the gym or I don't know what type of things you need, but I'm sure there'll be people listening to this thinking, man, you know, I want to give a helping hand to that. How can people do that in one way or another? Just look up able to be, look, get in contact with us. And I tell you what, if you look at what we do, if you look at some of the some of the videos online of what we do, we've got this DYA event now coming up. This is a fantastic event what we do. We get SEN children, disabled people with issues, children working with mainstream kids. And what we do is we sell a challenge a cycle challenge and a run challenge or walk challenge. Some of them are in wheelchairs and we pair them up and we get them to work together. Now, when, we, when they first do that, we have three workouts and we do the event. The first time they meet, no one wants to talk. They don't know each other. They're typical kids. And that's our job to break down them barriers, get them talking. So what I do is I use boxing. I put the pads on one person, the gloves on one, and I just teach them how to box. So then they got to start coaching each other. Well, how do you coach? By communicating, talking to each other. And then I'll take the pads off the one person, put and then we swatch. So the other person's the, the coach and the other person's the boxer. And they do the same thing. So then they've got something in common. By the second training session, they're talking, they're laughing, they're exchanging telephone numbers. They're, they're arranging to go out. 
when they do the day, it's in the cathedral grounds of Norwich, big cathedral in the background, absolutely phenomenal. You get SEN children work with mainstream kids on a cycle. We, we make sure we've got special cycles. They might be tricycles. They might, if they're in wheelchairs, you might will have a cycle with a big frame on the front for the kid to sit with the child, the student to sit on with his wheelchair. Everything's safe and they cycle around by the river, up around the cathedral. And you know what? This is going to be our fourth event this year. And it's a phenomenal, so emotional day. And if anyone wants to get involved and help out, talk, you know, donate, volunteer, we're always up for some help. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I say, first of all, I think that our visions of this type of line, because it's a big part of the reason, or really it's the main reason why I do these interviews. It's not just to talk about sports, but it's to give people that inspiration, motivation and so on. But also, with your organisation, if doing this video today helps even a few more people, oh. even if it's for more people, then, you know, our work is done to realise yeah. what And, uh, you know, that's that's a big part of why I wanted to talk to you. It's not just the boxing, but some of the other work you're doing as well. We now, also do, uh, like, online classes as well, so you can come in online and have free of charge. So we keep, we try and build up a community and be able to be where we can get where people can't come and see us. But three times a week... We have, and some people are locked in a in a care home or in the house on their own. They might have a carer come in for half an hour a day. The only time they get to socialize and have a bit of fun, bit of banter, as well as exercise, is when I come on their screen with a load of other people as well. Oh, that is amazing. That is amazing because, yeah, I mean, post-COVID in general, people are doing so much of that. <laughs> and like I said earlier, or actually like you said earlier, breaking down barriers and everything, <laughs> Um, I mean, doing things online as well as in person is a great way to, to break down barriers. So it's wonderful. And you know something, I've always said for years and years that boxing is a very healing sport because, you, you know, yeah. if you don't have these disabilities. Even if you see like a kid come into the gym and like you were saying, he's really shy or something, he won't talk to anybody. Give it a couple of weeks or a month, you know, he's talking to everybody. I mean, it's healing, you know, mental health, physical health. But you've taken that to a whole nother level with what you're doing, helping people through boxing. And I just I love your passion for it, mate. That's, not, mm, that's I, I love what we do. Love what we do. Yeah, I mean, I know we said earlier before um, we started recording, but I said choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your mm. life. And. Uh, I mean, that is really something that you, um, it really comes off you as a powerful energy. And I just, that's not even a question. I'm just saying yeah. keep that because the world needs more of that passion, my friend. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, all right, then. So here's another thing for you. I mean, during your boxing career, did you plan on transitioning into coaching and helping people? And if you did, did you ever imagine it would look like how it looks now, if, if that makes sense, like the then and now type yeah. of concept? Not at all. Um, I retired from boxing, and I've got to be honest. The last three fights I lost. The, the third, the, my European title, when I lost that, I shouldn't have lost that at all. Never in a month of Sundays. It was, I boxed in Norwich, defending my European title in Norwich. I felt I was a hands-down winner, but that's me. But I'm an honest pro, and if I thought there's any doubt in it, I would say No. But I never lost that fight. But after that, I seemed to lose the hunger. And um, I was getting on a bit. So then I fought Tom Glover, an old sparring partner, someone I used to spar with, and out box for fun. But when I went to the Wayne that night, the night before, I went, I went to him, all right, Tom, oh! And he just looked at me, how I, how I used to look at my opponents straight through me and I thought oh he's up for it my know-how how to beat him I knew how to beat him but what was greater was his ambition was his drive he wanted it more than I wanted it and he and he beat me and then after that I bought I boxed uh, Murray for the British title um and I, I just wasn't in the mood for it. I was in the mood for it right up until the bell rung in the first round. And I thought, what am I doing in here? And then I knew it was time to get out. So I had to have a bit of time off after. I had a couple of years off doing bits and pieces, then personal training, classes, etc. And then um, 
me and Graham Everett got together. I started, now I used to think I was a good trainer as a fitness coach. Not so much as a boxing coach, but Graham really taught me how to become a boxing coach. And um, I had some sus success with Graham Everett, with Billy Bird winning the Southern Area title. That was a massive moment for me. I was part of Sam Sexton's boxing or coaching team when he won the British title. Big moment. I was in the in the ring with um, Liam Walsh when he fought Giovanni Davis. You know, I've had some really good times in boxing and uh, as a trainer as well as a boxer. But, you know, when COVID hit, it really struck and everything sort of come like to go a different direction and this is the direction I went and um, to be fair I haven't looked back yeah that's amazing I just love that because I, I wondered like I said if you had your eye on maybe coaching a lot of people do but then it's taken a different um, different pathway but that makes sense with that story now it's really good that you're talking about some proudest moments there because you know what I do with this champ is when I speak to people who've had as many fights as you have I mean you know they've got as many stories as you've got um, it would be great to talk about all of them, wouldn't it? But I think mm. we'd be next week. I mean, that's why yeah. you're in books and things like that. But when it does come to, like, continuing with what you were saying there, some of your proudest moments, particularly as a boxer, you know, I know it's a big question, but the ones you look back on the most fondly and everything, um, let's let's continue down that line of reason because usually that's how I break it down with people who've achieved as much as you have because when I ask people this, they're not always the ones you expect that come back as, you know, being that's my favourite one. It can often be something mm. quite different than you expect. So, yeah, let's let's hear a little bit more about that in your own words, please, mate. My proudest moment in the boxing was winning the British title. It took me three attempts. I went on to win the European title after, but the proudest moment was beating Lee Meager. I was an underdog. I remember Boxer News saying winning the WBF title might be something, but never a Lonsdale belt. And I looked at that, and you know what? I was so determined because it was my third attempt. I'd lost to Jason Rowlands, Ricky Hatton for the British title. And one thing my dad said to me when I first turned pro at 18, he said, if you, do anyth if you can do anything, Jonathan, he's, that's what he used to call me, he said, I want you to... If you won a British title, you cracked it. 13 years to the day that I turned pro, I won that British title. And I remember the words of Sky Sports commentators, this Thaxton is sensational tonight. And I tell you what, it was my best performance by far. Absolutely. But my drive, my how much I wanted it was more than anything. I I felt I would have died in that ring. I you know, because I wanted it that much. You know. And when they turned around and said, and the new, it was just the best moment of my life. Yeah. Absolutely. Here's one for you then. You say that the best moment of your life. When I talk to people about this, some people say they, you know, they do their best to describe what it felt like in that moment. But a lot of people say that it's just beyond words when you win something like that, like the feeling that you have and what goes through your mind in that moment. Is that something you can put into words or are you one of the people where it, it sort of goes beyond words, if, if you get what I mean with that? Right. Before every fight, when a fight was announced, having said that, I took fights on short notice many times. But when a fight's announced, I go out for I used to go out for walks every 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 night. I train in the morning, train in the afternoon, sometimes train at night. But after my evening meal, I'd then go out for a walk. A to walk it off and B to visualize everything. What happened if I get cut? What happened if I get knocked down? What if I knock down them? What about this? And I go through every scenario that could happen over the four to six, the 12 weeks before the fight. I go over everything mentally. And I come back from a walk and I'm sweating because I'm so emotionally attached to this fight. And that's how I used to get myself up. I used to have my music in my ears. And I used to go over my, if I won the fight, I used to go over a victory speech, what I'd say. I'd also have a plan. If I lost the fight, I'd have a victory. I'd have a, a, a speech. 
Because the thing is, when you're live on Sky, when you're live on ITV, when you're live on the TV, and you just want a big fight, you can say so much shit. And if you, and let's be fair, if you get robbed in a fight, or you get beat, you can be really arsy about it. The best thing to be is humble. And nowadays, with all the Instagrams and the Facebooks and you name it, the online scenarios, let the public decide if you won, if you lost. You know, because as be fair about it, everyone nowadays has an opinion. Yeah. That they do. That they do. More than ever. Or at least we can hear about it more than ever anyway. Let's put it that way. But that's no, it. that's that's really cool. So, okay. So that's the feeling. And then the other thing I wanted to ask, because we've been talking about confidence and, you know, mental strength and all of these types of things, with it being your third attempt, was there any type of nerves or anything? Did it was there anything else you had to work through? And I don't mean that in any disrespect of fear or anything like that, but was there any more pressure than there would have been if it was like your first attempt or did that make any difference? No, nah, if, if I'd lost, I'd have retired. Yeah. You know, it's, it was as simple as that. If I'd have lost that fight, I, I, I don't think I'd have just retired and, 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 and I've been the guy who, um, who almost done it, but never did. But winning the British title, massive, massive to me. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Incredible achievement. And, uh, well, I mean, it speaks for itself. So a couple of other ones here to give a, a mention to as well. Um, winning the European title, you said it wasn't as big for you as winning the British title, but obviously it's still a massive achievement, and especially the EBU as well, because mm. there's, there's other variants that are out there. Yeah, various now. Hmm, yeah. And, you know, so, you know, you were winning the actual proper one and everything. Can you walk us through that fight? I mean, I don't have a narrow question about it, but the same type of thing when you look back on it now, your memories from the fight and what went through your mind when you won it, that type of thing. Yeah. Good, mate. Thank you. Right. Well, I, I fought for the European title six months beforehand and got beat by Romanoff. Yeah. Um, but I got beat on a cut eye. The corner stopped in the fifth round. But people don't know that cut happened three weeks before the fight. And I had a little cut there and everyone said to me, everyone said to me, you need to pull out the fight. You need to pull out the fight. You need to pull out the fight. But I thought, you know what? I trained so hard for this. It's only a little cut. No, I'm better than this kid. I wasn't listening. I was so drilled up to fighting this kid. But when I got into that ring for Romanov fight, I, I hadn't prepared properly because I hadn't done all my sparring. So, and he was very strong and he hit me and the cut opened and went right across my eye and Dominic Ingle actually stopped the fight. And I was bloody furious. And I thought to myself, you're an ass. I'm going to sack you. Got to the changing room. Got to the changing room. I looked at my eye in the mirror. It was horrendous. Went up to Dominic, looked at him. She put my hand out and said, thanks very much. You made the right decision. He was there to look after me. He's there to let me fight another day. If I'd have carried on with that fight, who knows what would have happened? I could have had a lazy eye. Who knows? But six months to the day, Romanoff went AWOL. We got a chance against... It's gone away from me. If we got another chance... And um, we won it. We won in uh, was it third round? Could have been third round. But I trained absolutely proper for that fight. But the thing I lit, I think I'd done right this time was listen. When I was fighting Romanoff, I wasn't listening. I just wanted it. But this time I listened. I listened to everyone. I'd done everything right. I walked in that ring in Norwich. We got it in Norwich. It was a packed arena, and we'd done it. And I I had a pretty damn sensational knockout and to knock him out in style for the european title in front of your hometown not bad not a bad feeling at all absolutely amazing i mean it's an amazing story no matter how many times because i you know i've read interviews you've given with this it's, it's always an amazing story but also the life lessons you shared there 
having the right people around you, listening to the right people. Like what you said earlier about the uh, visualization and everything. And when I interview people who've, who've reached the top, that comes up time and time again. There's a lot of little things. So I will say to our audience, guys, listen up, because there's some absolute gold dust in here of things you can use in your own life, boxing or otherwise, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think visualizing whether people are starting their own business, going into their own exams, doing any type of thing that they're aiming for. Um, Let me tell you, I'll, I'll tell you something, and this is this is massive to me. People always tell, ask me, how many fights do you win? So I'll tell them. I say, how many fights you lose? I said, I never lost a fight. They said, what do you mean? Yes, you did. I said, no, my L was always the learn. I won and I learn. I only lost if I didn't learn. Yeah. Wow, I love that. I love that. That's a... Uh... That's a good one for life because, you know, you, you have to take the fear of failure and you have to take these things mm. out of there, you know, because as you say, you learn a lot more. I mean, I've heard people, people have told me like with boxing and with even other things like this, with kickboxing, MMA, whatever, that they've learned more from losses sometimes. But without a doubt. Well, you, yeah. you know, if, if you do everything right, you're never going to learn. And if Absolutely. you're knocking everyone out, what are you learning from that? And, and nowadays, people are always protecting the O. Oh, I don't want to get beat. Uh, listen, I got beat on my, I think my eighth fight, and I was beat, getting beat throughout my career. But it didn't make me a worse boxer. It made me a better boxer. As long as I went back to the drawing board and thought, why did I lose that? But equally, when you win a fight, why did I win that? You know, it's okay reflecting on your losses, but reflect on your wins as well. Don't take your wins for granted. You know, because there's a lot of work and time and effort and coaching that's gone into that. So let's turn around and think, right, we won that fight because of X, Y, and Z. Well done. We need to do that again, plus some. Absolutely, yeah. 100%. 100%. Great outlook on it. Um, as well as that, you know, with your fight with, with Ricky that we mentioned earlier, Ricky Hatton, and yep. it's one of the unknown ones. We can talk about the fight itself a little bit if you want, but I'm also curious as like post fight. Have you seen much of him? Do you keep in touch with him? Um, work with him again after that? What like yeah, that? Type? It, listen, we know if we see each other. Hello, Hayden. Picture hug. Da da da. There you go. We've had we've been to the same dinners together. I sat next to him and this and other. Ricky was a phenomenal talent, let's be fair about it. And let's be fair about it, I got lucky in the first round. The first round, I hit him with a right hook, split his eye open, thought I'd won the lottery. Second round, the victory speech was all sorted. Third round, the mortgage was paid. But that's life, isn't it? You know? He went on. He went on. He had a good corner. And um, we had a hell of a fight. And I'm very proud of that fight. And when I say about my best performance was Lee Mega. My best fight that I enjoyed most was the Ricky Hatton fight. I loved it in there. I trained so hard for that fight. He was a body puncher. So I had to prepare for that. Physically as much as mentally. So I used to do 5,000 sit-ups a day for that fight. Yeah. 2,000, 2,000, 1,000 before I went to bed. And then you turn around and think, you know when people turn around and say, Oh, I've had a hard day at work. I said, yeah, me too. You know, 5,000 sit-ups. But every time he hit me to the body, I thought, you ain't getting me. You're not getting me. But he had to protect his eye. And let's be fair about it. That eye kept me in the fight. And we went we went 12 rounds. He beat me. The best man won. A lot of people say to me the fight should have been stopped. Should it have been? Listen, I'm glad it wasn't. Because it it is remembered for the war and the blood that it was remembered for. Yeah, it was absolutely that reason people still talk about it now so much. Just, you know, the action-packed nature mm. of it, what Ricky's gone on to achieve. I was just curious. I mean, I've met him once, worked with him at one of the after-dinner events, and he, you know, seemed like a lovely guy. Mm. And it's just one of those um, those sort of boxing trivia type of things people love to know about. Um, as well as that, though, a couple of other things. Obviously, the sport of boxing, since you've retired and in recent years and everything, it is changing um quite a bit i mean you mentioned about people keeping the old there obviously at the moment we are having good fights made like we had the undisputed recently and different things yeah but your thoughts on the good and the bad of the changes in boxing since your day i think would be a really good topic it's probably too big a topic to talk about everything but if there's a couple of things we could mention on either side i think yeah. that would 
Kevin, well, let me just say goodbye to my daughter. Once see you later. That's my daughter. All right, see you later. Bye. Love, you. <laughs> Love you. Um, right. Um, the boxing's changed now. From when I when I was about, I remember Brendan Ingle would turn around and say, "Jono, I've got your fight," and I'd turn around and I'd just take the fight because that's what I'd done. Um, nowadays, these people, these sometimes people just having a few fights, had had one. They're on the second or third fight. They're fighting a four rounder. They want to go in a camp. Camp? What's that about? I was always training. I didn't need a camp. I said, where are you camping? And then, after the four-rounder, they then want to go on holiday. And I think, come on, guys. Sort it out. You know, then you got the Misfits boxing. And you've got KSI earning millions and millions of pounds and who's it jake paul earning millions and millions of pounds and come on that they haven't got the background that's just my opinion they haven't got the schooling and they're calling out the big names let's be fair jake paul's now fighting mike tyson how old's mike tyson did i hear he was 57 years old yeah you know come on he's fighting an old man he knocks out Mike Tyson. He's going to have Mike Tyson on his record. Come on. That's not fair. It shouldn't be allowed. Mm. Yeah. Come on. You must have some. You, that, you know. But again, let's be fair. When I was up and when I was the up and coming in that, boxing, what I felt is what, what it should have been. Now, I feel boxing's a business. Let me get a little bit controversial here, and I do. I hope I'm not going to upset anyone because I don't want to. I'm not into that game anymore. Saudi Arabia, right? Eddie Hearn, Frank Warren never spoke to each other. Saudi Arabia come in with the money, and they're best of mates. You yeah. know, it's just money it is a business nowadays. And, and let's be fair about it. The best thing that can happen is Eddie Hearn and Frank Warren getting together? Because look at the show they're going to put on on Saturday night. Absolutely, yeah. But it should have been done a lot long time ago. How many fights have we missed throughout the career, throughout the years? How many fights have we missed? Because these guys were not talking to each other. Uh, yeah, too many, I think. You know, yeah, too many. we've lost too many. Yeah, or they happened too late, which is the other thing as well. Yeah. So you know, but, but you know, if you if you had when when you got this Turks money from Saudi Arabia's money, man, I, I don't know what they're paying, but I tell you what, it must be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy in that side of things. It's been a bit. It's been a breath of fresh air because you know. Of course it has. In that side of things it has, but it should have happened a lot, lot time ago. When you look at the Saudi Arabia side, brilliant. When you look at the Misfits boxing side of it, I'm not happy. Not good. No, I, I agree with you 100%, mate. I mean, the thing is, it's like with all of Jake Paul and all those sorts of people. I mean, you know, if, if people want to have a go, that's fine. But at the level they're doing it with the publicity, with the money, with all this stuff, not having a background, I don't agree with it. I'm on the same page as you. Yeah. Um. Yeah, with the Saudi, I mean, two sides to it. On the one hand, personally, I'm glad it's, it's happening now. But at yes. the same time say it's quite late in the game because at one point you know as a boxing uh journalist as a boxing photographer interviewer and i will just say as a boxing fan or, uh, because i enjoy the sport that's why i work around it you know it was looking like okay this sport really is broken and then at least now they they are making some repairs yes as you say, quite late in the game and getting rid of the old protecting the old thing as well i think because i mean looking back to history other than like mayweather and kazaki and a couple of guys all the greats of of lost fights and it doesn't make them any worse in fact it makes them more exciting you know i mean if muhammad ali had won uh you know like with fraser and these so if they if they just won against these guys easier and they didn't have the comeback you didn't have you would never have had some of the stories i mean nope. if you lost your british title it wouldn't be as exciting a story as it is when you won it on the third time you know I yeah mean, yeah you know what I mean? Because that's an amazing story, perseverance, sticking with it. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't fun for you at the time to, to lose the first two, you know what I mean? But it but it also makes the boxing story, in my opinion, better because then, in a way, you can be more interested sometimes 
if it's the third time thinking well or the second time is he going to do it this time what i'm trying to say is the loss doesn't take away from anybody so it's uh Really interesting, really big topic. Um, a couple of other things. Your advice for specifically for um, the up and coming boxers now, whether they're amateurs, whether they're just turning professional. We've touched on a couple of things through this. We're visualizing. We've touched on a strong mindset. We've touched on um, listening to your team. Some very good things. Are there any other things you would say to any of those who are listening to this? Because I know there's a lot of those guys that follow uh, my channel and everything. So I think it would be good to get. A little bit of knowledge in there as well for the up and coming the young guns in the game listen to your coach they know the hardest the hardest job in boxing to me is being the coach because you're the first in the gym you're the last hour they've got the knowledge they've got your best interest in heart that's why they're bloody there but make sure you've got a good coach because there's too many people who walk into a gym with a pair of hand pads. They may be good on the hand mitts, but they ain't got a scooby-doo about bloody boxing. So you need to be guided in the right direction. I had the Ingalls. I had Graham Everett. They are very passionate people. And they guided me. Brendan Ingle, he said to me, one of the first things he said to me, he said, Jono, you're going to win, lose, draw, get robbed but if you persevere and listen to me you'll get there now whether you think i got there or not yes i was never a genuine world champion but let's be fair about it i was the best boxer i could have been i didn't have the ability or the talent to become a world champion i didn't really have the ability or talent to become a european champion but i tell you what my hard work, my dedication, my discipline to beat me, you had to kill me at my best. And that's what made me into who I was. Absolutely. I love that. You know, that's one of my favorite answers of the whole interview, because um, th let me put it this way. Um, I'm just thinking the best way to put this. When I speak to guys of your generation, right, in broadly speaking, and it doesn't apply to everybody, and I don't want to offend anybody either, but just broadly speaking from experience of like 300 interviews and all the other things I've done, guys from your generation have a lot more passion in a sense. You're doing the sport of boxing for the love. When you speak to people now, not everybody, but there's a lot more people who want to do it for fame. They want to do it yes. for Instagram. Like, yeah, or get rich quick. That's the other thing. Yeah. Is they look like they're thinking okay i can have so many fights you know i'll win the big money it's sort of like a legalized bank robbery which i know is something mayweather said about his uh some of his exhibitions uh, in mm -hmm. the end coming back doing exhibitions and you look at that and you think okay well look everybody wants to make money i mean that's fine but at the same time when you're looking at it purely from that level i think it takes away from the from the sport it takes away from the choices people make in the sport and not only with boxing but for people listening to this doing things for the love like what you just said there will make you a lot happier in the end than mm. doing just for the money or just being famous i mean what do you think of what i'm saying there do you think i'm on the right track with it of course you're on the right track a lot of people do it for the wrong things a lot of people do it just to put stories on their instagram their facebooks back in the gym training fight i i i I've, i used to train a guy called I, I used to train this guy and all he does now is put on on instagram Oh, another hard day at the gym, another hard day at the gym. Let me tell you, this guy's never going to fight again. He's, he's given up his license. He's not even a pro hot license holder. And there he is. He's still, because he had, he's unbeaten, but he didn't fight anyone of any caliber. But he was unbeaten. And now he's turning around. He's, he's like in the, what I call an Instagram fight. All he is is post his stuff on Instagram, in the gym again, in the gym. So I always make a comment. Was there some exciting news to be announced, is there? And, you know, and that gets taken off straight away. He'll just delete it straight away. There's too many people doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Yeah, big time. And that's why it's such a breath of fresh air to see people like yourself doing it for the right reasons. Hmm. Um, and like I said earlier, I mean, uh, boxing, like, like I said at the beginning, I think it's a very healing thing. You know, when people go into a gym, whether they go on to fight or not, you know, I've seen, like I already said, shy people get their confidence or, you know, people who are overweight lose the weight or people with mental health issues learn to manage those issues through training and, and everything. And so many different things of the way, even the fact it brings people together. I mean, the old 
cliche that you go in a boxing gym and you've got policemen and criminals and everybody yeah. in between all hanging out and training in there. I mean, you don't get that in a lot no, of No, I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story. The co-founder who works for me is a surgeon. She's a lady, a surgeon. But when we, she went over the boxing gym, she was training with the professionals. No, she weren't training with the professionals. She was training with some, just some people who want to get fit, some scrappy guys. And they were some rough dudes. And they were, one was hitting one side of the bag and Rachel was hitting the other side of the bag and they were boxing. And I said, you two have got something in common. And this guy looked at me with to say, what have I got in common with her? I said, you cut people up, but she does it illegally. She does it legally because she's a surgeon. I said, she does it legally. You do it illegally. But there they were boxing together on the same bag. It brings everyone together. You know, you know, whether you're there, whether you're there, whatever pecking order you're in, you're in the gym smashing a bag, all working for the same outcome, to enjoy it, to get fit, to have yeah. fun. Yeah. Oh, that's a great story, that is, my friend. I love it that. It is funny, but, you know, yeah. it brings together all works of life, whether you're, whether you're swimming in money, whether you ain't got pots of piss in. Yeah. That's boxing. That is boxing. So last couple of things before we uh, before we wrap this up, last couple of things. I forgot to ask earlier, and I just want to touch on this very briefly, but you actually had a background in kickboxing or something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Before. I had 60 kickboxing fights, 60 kickboxing fights, full contact. Wow. 57 and 3. Yeah. Because I, I remember reading a story about one of your fights where you had uh, the kickboxing belts in the ring. Uh, yeah. And I think it was Mickey Duff was shouting, take them belts off. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's brilliant. So, Dean Hollington, double ABA champion. I got two weeks notice, a lifetime to me. Brendan said, I got you this fight, Dean Hollington. I said, okay. I, I spoke to Bra Graham about it. Because so, Graham has always been in my boxing career, whether he's been in the background or right at the front. But early in my career, he was, just in, he was just a friend. I used to phone for advice. I said, Graham, this is before the internet and uh, the forums and everything. I said, Graham, I've got, I've got a fight in two weeks. He said, who you got? I said, Dean Ollington for the vacant Southern Area title. He said, uh, he said, don't take it, John. Don't take it. I said, why? I said, he's a double ABA champion. He's 14 wins and one loss. I said, that's only your fifth fight. I said, Graham, I just want to fight. I want to fight. And I'm getting £2,000. <laughs> so I turned around and he said, well, no problem. So when it come, training up for it, Brendan said to me, John, I want you to put your kickboxing belts. I want all your kickboxing belts under your coat. We're going to cover you up. And then when you're announced, we're going to uncover them. And everyone's going to see your belts. I said, no, Brendan, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. He said, John, oh. We're fucking doing it. So I said, okay. So we sent the belts. I had belts, belts, belts. Got in the ring. And this was Dean Ollington's face. I took my belt off. And he went to his training team. I'd got him there mentally. When you beat someone there, beating them there is easy. So all of a sudden, first that's my th first knock knockout win. Everything else had been on points. And I beat him. I knocked him out in the third round. And then I phoned Graham up the next day. This is because he didn't, there was no TV about it. So I said, Graham, go. Uh, I said, Graham. He said, how'd you do? I went, three rounds. He went, never mind, John, you'll come back. I said, no, I knocked him out in three rounds. <laughs> oh, that is brilliant. That is brilliant. I knew the first part of it with the belts in the ring and everything, but I yeah. didn't know Mickey Duff went ball. mental. Mickey Duff went mental. Oh, my days. That is a story. Like I say, I meant to ask you at the beginning, and I just thought, oh, actually, we've got to get that one in. So the last thing, really, obviously, you're, you're training these people, and you're helping people, and you're living your best life and all of this side of things, and you're doing amazing. Obviously, um, you are remembered very fondly as a boxer, as I mentioned at the beginning. By the way, guys, check out this book. It's, it's an amazing book. There's like, some great interviews in there. Um, but how do you feel about your boxing legacy in terms of the respect and the love 
and you know the way people still talk about your fights now because not a lot of guys have it like you have it if that makes now, sense now I, 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 to be fair if anyone talks when people talk to me about boxing depends where i am i get very nervous very, okay. very strange and I, and I get very anxious um but it is nice that you you contact me that you still want to i've been retired 15 years now so it's nice i'm still remembered but I do get very uh, shy and very, and when I'm out and about, I do get very shy about it. Yeah, that's interesting. But, I mean, a few guys, a few guys have said that to me. Sorry, Carrie, I'm just hmm. yeah. No, no, like I say, but depends where I am and who I'm with. But if 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 I do get stopped or recognised, it is oh, yeah, that people say, "Are you who I think I am? Who you think?" I, and I'll, I'll always turn around. I say, "Does a person you think I am owe you any money?" Because I try and break the ice. And they go, yeah. no, no, no. I said, oh, I might be then. Uh, when the ice is broken, it's fine. But before that, I, I get very nervous and anxious. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it must be it must be strange, though. I mean, when people just approach you out the blue. And I, I know you, I know people get used to it. But a few guys have said that to me, actually, mm. quite a few guys. And I've always thought, like, you know what? Surely if you can get in the ring and, and fight somebody, yeah, surely that bother you but i do also get how i you know i get the, the situation of uh of that but that is that is very cool and my last question then we'll wrap this up is yeah i'd like to thank it's probably a very long list um so i don't want to put you on the spot to miss anybody but obviously you've mentioned uh the ingles you've mentioned people who've helped you on and off through this but before we wrap this up is there anyone else uh living or passed away or anything who's helped you to fulfill your dreams that you'd like to give a mention to before we uh wrap I tell you up. what I tell you what I'm going to mention a couple of people I mentioned Graham Everett because we we mentioned Ingalls Graham Everett he he's the one who brought me back from um, retirement uh, um so Graham Everett without him I wouldn't have won the British European title not a chance so Graham Everett renowned renowned trainer but my mum and dad they were there from the beginning um, from the minute I wanted to do kickboxing to boxing, um, my mum used to sell all my tickets. If my mum was around now and she's seeing what I do with the disabled kids and the adults, she'd be so proud. Everyone says to me, she's watching you, she's looking down on you, but I just wish she could see it. And I wish she, you know, she was there for now and my dad as well. One of the best bits of advice my dad said to me before the Lee Meager fight, he went, John, show him how good you are. Yeah. Well, nobody else who believes in you like uh, like mum and dad in life. I mean, that's hmm. the thing. You know, um, it's really good to give them a mention. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful thing, actually. I mean, I, John, I, if you don't mind me saying, I'm one of those people who believe that the people we, we've lost are watching over us and everything. Mm. But at the same time, I get what you're saying um, about about that. But it's beautiful the way they encouraged you. I just felt there was something there, to be honest, of like not the people that people hear about all the time, but in a sense, it's a bit behind the scenes in a way because yeah. you know yeah. how important their message was to you. You know how valuable that is, mm. but the people may not know that. So it's, it's really good for them to hear about how much that helped you. Well, you know, it's been a wonderful interview. Um, I really appreciate your time. And, you know, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I really think that as well as having some fun stories about boxing, we've also got the inspiration and the motivation. Uh, basically, those were the two things I was aiming for, you know, some fun stories. No, thank you. So I'm well happy, my friend. I will, um, I'll send you the link to this when I release definitely, it. Definitely, definitely, please. Thanks very much. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. But it's been luck. great going over old times. Love it, love. I'm yeah. still remembered after 15 years. Eh, there you go. Still remembered. And the final thing I'll say, my friend, you're still loved and respected after all that time because you know some of these fights. I mean, I spend a lot of time around the boxing from everything from like the small hall shows all the way to like obviously Matt Room and Frank Warren and what we've been mm. talking about. Um, as you know, I'm working in Cyprus now, so it's not as much of it out here. But in the UK, I'm always around it. And your name still comes up uh, and, you know, you still have that respect and that love. So um, take that with you. And, you know, I hope that uh, I hope, you know, how much people people remember your career and how fondly. Uh, thanks so, very much. You know, Thank that's you. A
That's the truth. Okay, best wishes, best wishes to your family, and uh, we'll speak soon. You take care. Thanks very much. Fantastic. I loved it. Loved it. Loved it as well. So did I. You take care, mate. Cheers. Take care. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.